Donald Trump may finally be reaping what he has sowed by reducing every debate to black and white, good versus evil. Today, he finds himself on the wrong side of history and at odds with former First Lady Laura Bush, former First Lady Michelle Obama, a united and energized Democratic Party, and the few Republicans in this country who are still in possession of their spines and their souls. The Trump administration today doubling down on its policy of forcibly separating children from their parents at the border. Former First Lady Laura Bush, in an extraordinarily rare rebuke of a policy and a sitting president, accurately describes the Trump policy as, quote, warehousing children in converted box stores and writes, quote, I live in a border state. I appreciate the need to enforce and protect our international boundaries. But this zero tolerance policy is cruel. It is immoral and it breaks my heart. She adds these images are eerily reminiscent of the Japanese American internment camps of World War II, now considered to have been one of the most shameful episodes in U.S. history. Former CIA Director General Michael Hayden goes even further, comparing these scenes at the border to Nazi concentration camps, tweeting, quote, this is Birkenau, then Germany, now Poland. No one who now walks through that portal on that siding can casually believe that civilized behavior is guaranteed. In response, the Trump administration deflecting blame but owning the hardline policy. Immigration is the fault and all of the problems that we're having because we cannot get them to sign legislation. We cannot get them even to the negotiating table. And I say it's very strongly the Democrats' fault. You see about child separation. You see what's going on there. But just remember, a country without borders is not a country at all. We need borders. We need security. We need safety. They could be murderers and thieves and so much else. So we want a safe country. And it starts with the borders. And that's the way it is. Or they could be infants torn from their mother's arms. We'll hear how the press secretary answers questions on this any moment. But first, to get us started, NBC's Jacob Soberoff is outside the Border Patrol's Central Processing Center in McAllen, Texas, where he's been doing remarkable reporting on this story from the beginning. White House reporter for The Washington Post, Ashley Parker, joins us. And here at the table, MSNBC political analyst Michael Steele, former chairman of the RNC, Eli Stokels, White House reporter for The Los Angeles Times, and Doug Thornell, a former senior advisor for the DNC. Because we started with Laura Bush, let me start with you, Michael Steele. Um, as a sitting first lady, Laura Bush rarely engaged oh. in policy or politics. And at the depths of George W. Bush's least popular hours as president, her uh, public approval remained, I think, in the high 90s. Yeah. So she has influence and she uses her voice very rarely. What did you think when you saw her comment? I, I thought it was a very powerful rebuke and I thought it was a very uh, profound moment um, in terms of national Republican voice that given all the folks who have titles and, and positions in Washington and around the country, hers as a former first lady stood out the loudest and the strongest and quite honestly the bravest to push back what is a reprehensible policy. Um, and, it, and it spoke uh, in a way that reminded uh, us of how uh, strong she was as a first lady, going back to the, those dark days you were talking about in, in the Bush term when the numbers weren't there. But also why, why she had so much respect, because she would oftentimes, in, in critical moments, bring that, that mother, that sense of uh, a woman, a parent, um, and, and someone who has a soul to a particular situation as she did with, with her comments today. Ashley Parker, I think the other way to describe it is she spoke to America's humanity. And I remember after 9-11, she was the first figure who went out. She went on television the next morning and talked to parents about how to, how to talk to their children about not being afraid. Um, she, hers was the first voice that, that we presented to the country the morning after 9-11. I wonder if there's a single person that you've come in contact with in the White House who has any discomfort with what's happening at the border. 
Yes, um, <laughs> they they do, or, or some of them do. And if you sort of watch everyone in this White House, is even their public comments uh, quite carefully, you see that they are trying to not break with the president, who has a very tough on immigration line, but also trying to reflect their own kind of personal view, because as Laura Bush uh, articulated so well, it's not just an issue of politics or policy, but one of moral conscience. Um, and so you do have some people going out there, uh, even publicly, and kind of saying, you know, you even saw the First Lady, for instance, saying that that families should not be separated from their children, parents should not be separated from their children. You saw Kellyanne Conway, counselor to the president, publicly uh, trying to hedge a little bit um, and saying that, you know, no one really thinks this is a good idea. Of course, that's not purely true. There are some people in the administration who also conversely, both publicly and privately, will say this is a good idea. This is the rule of law. This is working as a deterrent. Um, so it is mixed, but this is an incredibly difficult issue for them uh, on a level of, again, politics, policy and humanity, uh, and it's something they're all grappling with, how, how to handle it. Jacob Sobrov, you've moved from the facility um, to the border. Um, tell us uh, the, the story of, of the human toll, obviously the most important part of this story. Look, what I saw yesterday, Nicole, and, and that's, what's, that's what stuck with me, is the inside of this uh, processing center at the McAllen Border Patrol Station. This is the epicenter of where this is all going down. The conversation that's happening back in Washington so often is disconnected from the reality and the facts on the ground. Uh, and the ground in this instance is McAllen, Texas. This is the place that has the most Border Patrol apprehensions. They happen right there at the Anzal Duas Bridge behind me uh, almost every single day. And by the virtue of the traffic that comes through here, that means the most child separations are now happening here. And we're looking at some of those pictures, you know, on the screen of the Mylar blankets and the cage fences. I mean, this conversation about there are no cages, I'll tell you right now. There are cages. I saw them with my own eyes. Uh, and they look like dog kennels. Uh, and there's no other way to describe them. There are uh, children that are alone in them. And there's an increasing number of children alone in them as a direct result of the Trump administration policy to separate children uh, from their parents. And it's not only uh, putting these children in HHS facilities on their own, taking parents and putting them in federal prison, but it's putting a stress on the staff at, at these centers. Uh, and that's what Border Patrol agents are telling me. There were four social care workers in this one center where we're looking at the cages on the screen and that's four social care workers for kids that are left alone by their parents uh, and it could be in the hundreds and that number's only going up. It is, a, it is a building crisis in slow motion real time. Jacob, can you debunk a few things that are swirling around on social media and other places? There are people asking where are the girls and where are the youngest children? We can't tell you for sure because the Department of Health and Human Services, which actually administers the shelters, has only let us into two, one in El Cajon, uh, California, and the other one over in Brownsville, about an hour away from here where I was late last week. And the one in Brownsville was only boys between the ages of 10 years old and 17 years old. Uh, and the one in El Cajon was also uh, young boys for the most part. At least that's uh, what NBC News saw when we went in there. So the Health and Human Services, which by all accounts offers um, pretty good service to these children in pretty respectable uh, facilities um, just hasn't been as transparent as we would like them to be. And granted, they're dealing with an influx of people. 11,000 kids plus are in their care right now, and that number's only going up. Um, but the world wants to know, where, where are the toddlers? Uh, that this that this program is separating. Where are the young girls that this program is separating? We have not seen them. I've seen the boys with my own eyes, but I haven't seen the girls and I haven't seen the toddlers and, and nobody's let me get in to see that yet. Something else I've seen in some of the coverage is that they're not permitted to touch these children. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. And this is very this is all very complicated because these kids are effectively incarcerated and the rules, even if they're in a shelter by name, are bound by uh, you know, certain strict policies. And one of them is one that's designed to protect children from sexual assault when they're incarcerated. And so that policy was never designed to be administered in a scenario where children are separated from their parents uh, as a matter of systematic policy by a presidential administration. So when you have little kids that are ripped away from their parents and their caregivers can't give them a hug or pick them up, uh, or even change their diaper if that's something that they need. Um, because of a policy designed for something completely different, you get into this situation like the one that we're in right now, at which, um, uh, again, by all accounts, including medical professionals, it, it will create extreme trauma that lasts for a lifetime in these kids. It was a, it was a sickening thing for me as a father of a two-and-a-half-year-old to be inside that facility yesterday 
and see these little kids and know that some of them may sit there for 24 hours before they're picked up and their parents are gone to go to Health and Human Services. Um, Jacob, stay stay up with us and, and, and jump in if we get uh, if we stray from any of the facts. I think we should stay in the facts. They're appalling enough, and and, um, and and we hope Sarah Huckabee Sanders will have some answers in our in our hour, and we like your help fact checking all that. Um, but Eli, let me let me read a little bit more of Laura Bush's piece to you. Uh, she writes, Americans pride ourselves on being a moral nation on being the nation that sends humanitarian relief to places devastated by natural disasters or famine or war. We pride ourselves on believing that people should be seen for the content of their character, not the color of their skin. We pride ourselves on acceptance. If we are truly that country, then it is our obligation to reunite these detained children with their parents and to stop separating parents and children in the first place. That is the opposite of what is happening. What Jacob just described is the incarceration of children and children whose diapers aren't getting changed because they're being treated like criminals who they can't touch. Right, and the people in this administration who are defending this policy don't want to acknowledge the fact that these are children. They talk about this in very clinical terms. They talk about this being a matter of law and order. We're enforcing the law. These laws have been on the books for a long time. They don't want to focus on the children. Um, there's something important, though, to notice here. This is not a president, obviously, who has been moved or has really seemed to care about carrying the mantle of moral leadership that has defined this presidency throughout history up until the 45th president. He hasn't been moved by claims of, we're America, we need to to lead, set an example for the rest of the world. But he is a president who, maybe more than any of his pre predecessors, is a media figure, a television president. This presidency has been compared to a television show. And if anything is capable of moving them to relent, you already see the president changing his story. First, it was the Democrats' fault. He also said today, well, we're doing this because we don't want the, uh, the influx of migrants that we've seen in mm -hmm. Europe. He's starting to change his story. And if anything mm -hmm. will, I think, move this president and this administration, and perhaps Republicans in Congress, to come up with a solution. It's the fact that all of this is now being broadcast wall to wall on television. People are seeing the images. It's harder to ignore the fact that we're talking about really young kids here. And I think, you know, even some of the statements that were sent out today, Ben Sass, Republican senator from Nebraska, yeah. he included that still image of that little girl next right. to the car in tears. So did John Kasich in his statement. Republicans, people who are opposed to this policy, they appreciate the power of images to change the narrative, to affect change. And, and this president, uh, for all the things we say and we know about him, uh, he definitely is susceptible to what he knows is the, the pr prevalent media narrative on television and reactive to that oftentimes. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.